we are going to continue our discussion of vectors now looking at how we add vectors by components and digging in a little bit more deeply into some of the things we can do with vectors. So we know how to resolve a vector now. We know how to take a vector and break it down into its components. So what we want to know now is how do we add those vectors by components. So if I have vector A and vector B shown here, I could resolve vector A into an A sub X component and an A sub Y component, and vector B into a B sub X component and a B sub Y component. Vector R is the sum of those two vectors. R sub X would just equal to the sum of the two X components, and R sub Y would just equal to the sum of the two Y components. If I wanted to find the tangent of theta, or if I want to find the angle of theta that R would make with a line parallel to the positive x-axis, I can just use this tangent relationship. Once I know R sub y and R sub x, I could take the inverse tangent to get theta. I can also find the length of R by doing R sub x squared plus R sub y squared and taking the square root. So when I add vectors by components, I just find the components of the vectors, and then add them. In this image, we have vector r, which is equal to a minus b. The first thing to look at is, how is it that r is equal to a minus b? We know that a minus b would equal to a plus negative b. We also know that that would equal to negative b plus a. So if we look at our picture of b here, if this is b, negative b would have the same magnitude, but would just go in this direction. So if we have negative b plus a, we get r. And so with that, we see that r is equal to a minus b. We subtract vectors by components just the same way that we added them by components. We subtract the components. So I would figure out a sub x and a sub y, and I would figure out b sub x and b sub y, and I would do a sub x minus b sub x would give me r sub x, a sub y minus b sub y gives me r sub y. The tangent of theta would equal to r sub y divided by r sub x, and again I could switch that around to solve and figure out what theta is. We'll also find that I could find the length of r by doing r sub x squared plus r sub y squared to determine the length of r. This is going to be really, really important because you will do a lot of adding and subtracting vectors by components as we go on. One thing that's really important to realize is when I have vectors like a and b, I cannot just add and subtract their magnitudes. You can see that the length of R is not equal to the difference in length of A and B. If I just did the magnitude of A minus the magnitude of B to get R, it would be incorrect. You have to add and subtract vectors by components. You cannot just add and subtract magnitudes. One of the things we do to sort of make this easier is we use unit vectors. This is another one of those topics that sometimes students get confused about, um, but it's not actually that big a deal. It is funny because if you try to Google why are they important, lots of people like to talk about it because I think a lot of times people don't understand why they're important. They're important because they let us sort of assign directions to values really simply. Instead of using the a sub x, b sub x, y sub x, because we can't really add those, we just say I have a unit vector i hat that is equal to one unit in the x direction. That unit can be anything. It could be meters, it could be meters per second, it could be meters per second squared, it could be newtons, which is a unit of force we'll look at later on, any of those. I also have a unit vector j that has a length of one unit and it points in the positive y direction and a unit vector k that has a length of one unit and points in the positive z direction. So I can now write vectors 
as vector a is equal to a sub x i plus a sub y j. And honestly, people usually say i hat and j hat. We would say that a sub x i hat and a sub y j hat are the vector components of a. We can add and subtract those vector components with other vector components. So anything that is a vector component times i hat, or anything that's a vector component involving i hat can be added to any other vector component involving i hat. Any vector component adding j hat can be added to any other vector component involving j hat. So you can always add your i's, your j's, and your k's sort of in a column. We can add and subtract vectors using these vector components. So if we have vector r, which we know is the sum of vector a plus vector b, we're going to look a little bit more closely at just doing r sub x and how we do that in terms of i. So we know that there's some length a sub x that represents the x component of vector a. And we could find it by dropping a line straight down from the start of a and straight down from the end of a. And it would have this length a sub x. By adding i hat to it, we also give it a direction. In this case, a sub x would clearly be a negative number because this points in the negative x direction. We could also look at b, and we could find b sub x i. b sub x is clearly a positive number because this points in the positive direction. And when we add those two together, we would get r sub x times i hat. It's important to know r sub x times i hat is a vector. a sub x is just a scalar. We know it's in the x direction, but it's truly just a scalar, and this is a vector. We can add these vector components together. We could do the same thing for y. In this picture, z is 0, because you guys just saw how fabulous I am at trying to draw in three dimensions. So I decided to spare you that and just do this in two. But there could also be an r sub z k hat if this was a three-dimensional figure. It's a little chance to practice that. So based on the drawing below, if vector a can be expressed in unit vector notation is 5i plus 4j. Vector b can be expressed as 7i minus 3j. We want to figure out what c is in unit vector notation. There are a couple things you need to do here. First, you need to figure out the relationship between a and b. Once you figure out the relationship between a and b, you need to figure out how that would relate to vector c. We're going to take, we've talked about position in general with these vectors, but now we're going to talk about how we describe velocity and acceleration in three dimensions. So we can locate a particle by doing a what we call a position vector from the origin to where the particle is. So we could say there's a particle at 5 meters i, 4 meters j, and negative 2 meters k. And that's a position vector that tells us right where that particle is. If we add time, we can start to figure out velocity and acceleration. We are going to begin by looking at displacement. So here I have a particle. It is located by position vector r1. That particle undergoes some displacement. It moves. That's all we're really saying when we say it undergoes a displacement. So that now it can be identified by position vector r2. And that displacement is that change in position we can find and we can describe that change in position is the change in x times i hat plus the change in y times j hat plus the change in z times k hat. So let's look at that a little bit more closely. We could say that r1 plus delta r equals r2. If we rearrange that equation just a little bit, we see that delta r is just equal to r2 minus r1. This is really just how we 
described displacement before as the final position minus the initial position. We would subtract these as vectors. Remember, this wouldn't be the length of R1 minus the length of R2. It would be the difference in their x components plus the difference in their y components plus the difference in their z components. Just like this. To find velocity, then, we would have a component of velocity in each of those three cardinal directions. We would take that displacement and just divide it by the time as we did before. This delta t would be the same for all of these. It would be how long it took that particle to move from position r1 to position r2, and that would give us the average velocity. We could also find instantaneous velocities if we were able to make our delta t as small as possible, but for the most part you're going to sort of look at average velocities as you move in three dimensions. Finally, if that velocity was changing and we could figure out how much it changed in x, how much it changed in y, and how much it changed in z over some unit of time, we could make an average acceleration vector as well.